Okay, this is the star life cycle um, set of notes, and this is not in your note packet. You will not find it in your note packet. Um, you're going to need to write down the definitions. You might have given a, might have been given a sheet that has the terms, and then you write them out, or I might not have given you a sheet at all, and you'll just have to write them out. But you need to have these definitions down packed, and we are going to map this out. We're going to draw the life cycle out in class. So what you're about ready to see is just the definitions, and then you need to correlate those with the diagram that we make in class. Now, I know that this isn't in your, um, your packet, but this particular slide is. So you can get your packet out. The rest of it is not. So get your packet out, and you should have um, star life cycle, three separate paths depending on mass. Mass is going to be the determining factor for which direction, which path a star takes. So we have low mass, medium, and high mass options. And the sun is a medium mass star and is projected to be stable for another 5 billion years. And we'll talk more about what that stability means later. Okay, so that slide is in your notes. The rest of it is going to be on a different sheet of paper, and I just want you to write definitions. Here we go. So it starts with a cloud of gas and dust, and it's called a nebula. So out there, there's a whole bunch of clouds of gas and dust. This is a famous one. This is the Eagle Nebula. Um, and you can see a foreground star here, but you've got all these clouds, and some of them absorb light, and some of them actually will reflect it, and some of them will actually generate their own, depending on what stage it is in the star formation. So nebula is like a stellar nursery. This is where stars are born. This one right here is the Horsehead Nebula. This is a dark nebula that's absorbing the energy. Um, you see some either reflection or some emission from some of these other nebulas near it. Nebula. From a nebula, you have um, contraction, okay? So some kind of shock wave moves through and begins to contract the gases and the dust. And when it contracts, it begins to heat up. When it heats up, it begins to glow. So a protostar is what is the next step. And it's when the gases contract the heat up. Fusion has not started just yet. That's why it's called a protostar rather than a full-blown star. This is an artist's rendition of what a, the protostar might look like. So it begins to glow. And we've actually seen these um, real images. Um, I don't have any on here, but we've actually seen these. And so brown dwarf is the pathway for a very low mass star. So all stars will start in this, the nebula stage. Then they go to protostar. And then if it's a very low mass, it will only go to the, the brown dwarf. So this is going to be very low mass protostar. It's less than 0 0.08 solar masses. So that means it's definitely a lot smaller than our sun. One solar mass would be equal to our sun. So a, a 0 0.08 is really, really small. This is an artist rendition showing what the sun looks like compared to a brown dwarf. And then this is Jupiter, just to give you a perspective on size brown dwarf comparison here. Okay, main sequence. Once the protostar builds up enough mass, if it's, if it's a medium mass star, it will build enough for fusion to kick in. And once that happens, we now have a new name for that star. It's no longer a protostar. It's called a main sequence. So <clears throat> if you have your flow diagram that we made in class, if we made it before you're seeing this, then be sure to have that out in front of you so you can kind of track the pathway. But main sequence is going to be stable, and that, that's a big deal, that, that word stable. That really means that the forces are balanced. And if you consider what forces would be happening in a star, you have a very large fusion force outward, and it's counterbalanced by the gravitational force inward. They balance each other so the star isn't like swelling up and shrinking and swelling. and It's just staying equal. And that's where our sun is right now in a main sequence. And it will stay there as long as there's enough hydrogen in the core to continue fusing. So the forces are balanced, the star is stable, hydrogen is fusing. And that's the only element that's fusing, and it's only fusing in the core. So our sun is a great example of a main sequence star. Um, this illustration is showing that we have the fusion force out by that force arrow, and then we have a gravitational force inward, and they're equal. Equal and opposite. 
Okay, we're going to um, follow a medium mass star here. So we have we start with nebula, then we go protostar, then we go main sequence. Once the hydrogen runs out in the core, it's no longer called a main sequence. It's now going to be a red giant. And this is really for a medium mass star. Low mass star really ends with brown dwarf. But hydrogen runs out in the core, heavier elements now begin to fuse. And we, I, I'm not sure if we've talked about fusion yet in class, but um, there's a domino effect of swelling and contracting and swelling and contracting that, that takes place. And we'll talk more about that if we haven't already. But heavier elements begin to contract and fuse into carbon and oxygen and, and so on. The, car, the star swells up. The outside cools, the inside becomes more and more hot as, it, as each element begins to fuse, and they kind of go in order. This star is now unstable. If you remember what stable mean with the main sequence, think about what unstable might mean. Unstable means the forces are not balanced, so fusion is winning and the star swells up. Still have gravity, but fusion is out out competing that gravity. We consider this stage the star is now dying. It's fusing heavier elements and it's going to burn through those. It expands out, it stretches out. Fusion is kind of winning here with the force outward. You have helium that is building up in the core and it contracts and then it, it starts to fuse into oxygen carbon and it becomes red when it swells. The outside actually cools. Okay, once the red giant hits around carbon or oxygen and it contracts for the last time and it can't trigger enough temperature to trigger the next element of fusion, okay, so it like basically it contracts carbon and it just can't quite get that heat to fuse oxygen, um, then the whole thing becomes unstable and it implodes on itself. Gravity wins because fusion has stopped. And then it explodes, and the small explosion with a medium mass star is called a nova. So it's more of a poof rather than a bang. And when it does, it shoots out um, some of the mass. It explodes and shoots out some of the mass into what's called a planetary nebula. And planetary is just added to the word nebula. This is, was our stellar nursery. This was our starting point. So here's where your cycle is. We start back at the nebula, but this time it's called a planetary nebula. It has nothing to do with planets, but it's formed from a nova. It's a cloud of gas and dust, just like we said before, and it surrounds the core from mass thrown during the nova. So right here you see this is an actual image of debris that was shot out from the star, and what's left behind is the dead core. So this is a planetary nebula showing that a nova occurred, this big explosion. Here's another one. You can see all this debris spread out, and we have the dead core in the center, which there's a name for that dead core in the next slide. And then here again, we have debris coming out. So the nova explosion creates a planetary nebula, and then we have a white dwarf, which is the dead core that's left behind after that explosion. So our sun is a medium mass star. So once it goes out of a main sequence stage and becomes a red giant, it will eventually go nova, form a planetary nebula, and what's left behind is the dead core called a white dwarf. Size-wise, okay, guys, this would be the size of Earth. Like, literally, this is not an analogy. This would be the size of Earth, but the mass of the sun smashed into the size of Earth. So if you were to take sampling of that material, it would weigh a ton per teaspoon. That's pretty insane. Low and medium mass stars actually have the longest lifespan because they're not burning fast and furious through their fuel. So it's just a little side note. They have a very long lifespan. You don't have to write any of that down. You're only really writing the definitions right now. This shows you a size comparison. Here's Earth, and here is um, a white dwarf called 40 Eridanus Beta. Okay, now, we, now we're going to go high mass. So we start again. So every star starts at the nebula and then goes protostar. And if it doesn't go to a brown dwarf, then it will go to a main sequence. And if it's very high mass, when it runs out of the hydrogen in the core, it's not going to become a red giant. It's high mass. So what do you think it's going to become? High mass. A red supergiant. This is where science gets friendly and it makes sense. The word makes sense. So this is not, super, this is not a red giant. It's a red supergiant because it's very massive. Hydrogen runs out. Fusion of heavier elements begins. And it goes further than the red giant 
would go. The red giant goes to maybe oxygen or carbon, but this is going to go all the way to iron. It is still considered unstable, just like the red giant was, and it's dying. This is the sun. This is a star called Aldebaran. Size-wise, these are crazy different. This is a very, very big red supergiant star. It is on its way out. It is dying. Here's another. This is a popular constellation seen during the winter time. This is Orion. You can see the three stars of the belt um, in the knife area. There's lots of cool nebula in this area. And then we have the bottom stars and the shoulder stars. And then there's this shield set of stars here. This one right here is Betelgeuse. There's other um, pronunciations, but I like that one the best, Betelgeuse. And this is a red giant. This is showing the size of this red giant star. So it's taking and bracketing the end, the edges of that star. Okay. This right here, from this point to this point, is the Earth's orbit around our sun. So that just gives you a perspective on huge, how huge the star is. So if this were, if this were the sun, our Earth would be inside it. That's how big it is. And then Jupiter's orbital path, you know, the sun would be in the center, and this is how big it, it orbits that our sun. Jupiter would also be inside this star. So gives you perspective on how huge these supergiants are. Okay, now the red supergiant will go through and fuse through heavier and heavier elements. And right before it goes supernova, this is what the core looks like. So we have all this different lined up fusion. So we have hydrogen just floating around the outside. It's not fusing. Then we have it hot enough right here that hydrogen is fusing. And then helium fuses inside of that. It's even higher temperature. Carbon is beyond that, then oxygen, then neon, then magnesium, then silicon, and finally iron. Once iron builds up in the core enough that fusion stops because iron can't fuse, the engine stops. And so gravity wins, implodes this iron. Um, the rest of the layers implode as a response to that. Um, and fusion cannot kick in again because iron can't fuse. So the whole star implodes and is highly unstable and then explodes in a huge, huge supernova. Massive explosion of an unstable high star high mass star. So this right here is an image. This is an actual image of, of the before star. And this is it going supernova. I don't know how far away this star is from us, but I'm sure it's thousands of light years away. And this is how bright it is. Here's a, a little video clip of an artist's rendition of what supernova might look like. So it explodes out and you have a nebula form again. And then you have these beams of radiation and energy that come out and it's spitting. So you have this dead core that's left behind. So supernova creates a nebula again. So this is again where the, the cycle happens. <clears throat> you can actually see supernova events occur in other galaxies. So this is a whole other galaxy. And right here is the supernova 2008D. Look how big it is. It's, it's, it's like half the size of that galaxy. It's huge. Okay, neutron star. So what are the dead cores of a supermassive star? There's two options, a neutron star or a black hole. So a neutron star is also called a pulsar, and I'll tell you why in class. But it's extremely dense. It's a rapidly spinning core because of the collapse and then the explosion. Gravity is so intense that the electrons in the atoms smash inside the nucleus and combine with protons. Friends, this is not normal. <laughs> this is not natural. And so it's, it's full of neutrons. They become neutrons. Um, Size-wise, these would be the size of Michigan. Um, 300,000 times the gravity of Earth, however, and about one and a half times the mass of our sun, all smashed into the size of Michigan. These are just some images that show kind of an electromagnetic field, why they, why they have beams of radiation coming out the poles and so on. My time is getting short, so I'm going to try to speed this up. Black hole is the other dead core option, and this is going to be the most extreme massive stars will form these. And the gravitational field is so intense, like cannot even escape, and it, it is the end of, a, of the highest mass star that there is. Size-wise, volume-wise, it's smaller than the city of Portage. Okay, so this is an artist's rendition of the event horizon of a black hole. And so gravity gets stronger and stronger, indicated by the box sizes. So the influence of gravity goes stronger and stronger. So, so stars that might go by it might swirl into it and then disappear into it. And then it'll gain mass and have an even stronger gravitational influence. Here's another arti artist's rendition. So we have stars changing their trajectory. And if they get too close, they'll orbit it. 
and if they get too close, they'll spin inside that event horizon and disappear. All right, my time is up. Um, hopefully you have your definitions down.